Good morning, Southwest. Good morning. I'll say it one more time. Good morning, Southwest. It's a beautiful day God created today. Um, this past week, I was talking with um, Calissa about something that I was hoping she would do, and she was afraid of it at first. I won't say what it is yet. But she thought about it, and she said, You know what, Daddy? The devil's mad at me because I've been worshiping God. I'm not going to let that rat scare me. So, and that was, one of the, that was one of the times that I remember that my heart was the warmest. So it may be cold outside, but it's warm in here. Let's all stand and praise God today.
It's time for communion. Um, I'm going to read out of J uh, James, starting on uh, verse 13. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call the elders and the church to come pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. 
Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you are committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and produces wonderful results. I think we're all a little sick in some way today, and I think we're all suffering in some way today, and I think we're all happy in some way today, um, even if it's just a little. <laughs> but um, let's take a minute, a few seconds, a minute here, and we're going to close our eyes and pray quietly to yourself, and then uh, if you have anything you need to confess to the Lord, just get, clear your hearts and clear your minds so that when it's time for to take communion and then time to hear the message that we're ready for it. Um, we'll, we'll do a silent prayer for a little bit and then I'll finish in prayer and then we'll take communion. thank you. Thank you for letting us come here. Lord, thank you for allowing us to have a place to worship you, Lord. Thank you for giving us a way to put it online for the people who need to stay at home, Lord. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for giving us a way to get closer to your son. Lord, just help us to move on from whatever the pain is, whatever the suffering is. Lord, help us be happy in your name because you are the Lord, the Savior that gives us all the strength to go on, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, I say amen. All right, let's take communion. I'm not sure why Joel's name popped up there, but we're preaching for Micah today. So if you have your Bibles with you, make sure and open that up. Um, and we'll, let's say a quick word of prayer before we start studying, because what we do is something that is very sacred and honorable in worship and in the study of God's word together. So if you'll bow your heads, let's pray together. Father God Almighty, we give you the praise, glory, and honor. We lift your name, Jesus Christ, high in this place. You're the only name worthy of being bowed to, to worship, to love. You're the one that holds all things together. And so in that confidence and hope, we study here this day. We preach your word. We, we worship together. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch us, to change us, to mold us, and make us that, whatever you need us to be. We trust in you, Holy Spirit, to, to uh, just lead and guide our minds. And as we look at the truth of your word, we uh, just thank you for, for that opportunity. Again, pray for you, Jesus, to be heard loud and clear in this place. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so the first question I want to ask you this morning to kind of get you rolling is this. How, how Any of you ever get in trouble with your parents uh, growing up? How about we got a lot of youngsters in here today? Any of you guys ever get in trouble with mom and dad? A few of you? Okay. Here's a question. When you get in trouble, and so um, just a little explanation between the generations, uh, the older generation and our younger ones in here. My question is, do you get to determine uh, the outcome, the uh, discipline, the punishment for whatever you did wrong? Because, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but our older generations, the one in here that, 
that may not have as much hair as you younger ones or may have different color hair uh, that's not dyed that color. Um, for them, it was usually more the question, their, their involvement in the discipline process was you get to pick which switch you get to, use, get to be used on you. Uh, so that was more their time. How about you younger ones? Any of you ever get to uh, talk or have a conversation about what your punishment would be? Anyone? Tommy. Well, okay. You know, they, they say that in child psychology and these modern times, that that's the process that we're supposed to use in, in discipline. And I, I can recall doing a little bit with that with my sons. Uh, we used to uh, do uh, Kevin Lehman's reality uh, discipline. And uh, what he talks about in that is, uh, say, like a kid's room. Um, you know, there's toys spread out all over the place. Uh, any of you ever experienced that or, you know, you see that? We don't have little kids in our house anymore, but we have two little dogs. It's the same thing. We put their toys away, and they drag them all out everywhere. Every day it's that process. So if you have that with your child, this is what Kevin Lehman, the child psychologist, Christian child psychologist, says. Set a timer. Tell your child, hey, you know what? It's your choice, but we're going to set a timer, 10, 15, 30 minutes, whatever you want to make, but don't make it too long. Set that timer, and at the end of that time, whatever toys are left on the, on the, on the floor there, we're going to pick those up, we're going to put them in a bag, and we're going to take them down to the homeless shelter. All right, so we tried that a few times. Now, we did bag up some toys. I do recall some that we just got for Christmas that went up in the attic and was gone for a while. Uh, but we did, you know, get rid of some of those things, and it worked pretty good. The reason I bring all this up is because today we're taking a little side step to Hosea. Uh, we're going to look at one quick message from Micah because of our group here today. But in the midst of Micah, we have this issue of people that were not doing right, a country that was doing wrong in many ways, uh, they were not following the discipline of God. Uh, they were not definitely being involved in the process, and they were not listening to what he was saying. So in our book of Micah, we actually have the doom and consequences talked about a lot, but then we have the hope spoke about a lot. I think kind of goes with what Ron was saying here earlier, you know. We may have some sadness, we may have hurt, we may have feelings that we're dealing with sickness, whatever that is, but we also have happiness and joy. And so in the midst of everything going on in our world today, how do we keep that balance, that joy, that understanding? So we take a look at this. The big question that the world asks is this, and in Micah 7.10, uh, it says, She who said to him, Where is the Lord your God? Now the reason uh, I have that first is because the question being asked is, Where's your God? Look at everything going on. Look at all the things happening. Look at the things happening to your family, your community, all this. This was the question being asked back then. Look at what's happening to our nation. Where is your God? You guys ever ask that question? Or you ever hear that question asked of you? You know, this is a question that the world often asks. Now, this next question, what is just? And this is what we've been talking about. Who determines what's just? Any of you kids, you get to sit down with your parents, you uh, told a lie, you cheated on something, you stole something, you did something, whatever the case is, you sit down with mom and dad, or whoever, grandma and grandpa, you sit down, who determines what's just? I've already seen a lot of heads on, the kid normally doesn't get much of a chance to say what's just. The parent usually determines what's just, and what is justice in that question. And then the final question is, who determines it? Again, right now in this house, every one of us in this house, who determines what sin is? Good answer. God is, and God is sovereign, and his word is sovereign and true. Matter of fact, God's word says that it's a book for all places at all times, that those things don't change. That's why we try to so strongly encourage young and old to get into a habit of reading that Bible on a daily basis. He is the determiner of those things. And so as we look at Micah, we're going to jump around through the book a little bit. But in the very first portion of Micah chapter 3, it says, Then I said, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice? 
Isn't this a big question that's being asked, especially here in our, the United States of America right now? Should you not know justice? What is the definition of right and wrong? Who determines those things? Can those things be legislated? Can those things just be determined by the masses or groups? Is right and wrong determined by a group of people that just say they get together and say, well, this is no longer right. This is no longer wrong. These are the kind of things that we see swirling all around us today. It goes on, Micah 3.8, But as for me, this is here talking about Micah, I am filled with the power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and my to declare to Jacob his transgressions, to Israel his sin. Here's the deal. You and I in this room, many of you have claimed Jesus Christ Lord and Savior. You walk with him, you believe in him, you study his word. But as he was talking here to Micah, he has been filled with the Holy Spirit to do what to the nation of Israel? Basically to say, hey guys, look what we're doing. It's got to stop. There are consequences to be paid for sin. And when a nation determines that it doesn't care what right and wrong is and it's going to rewrite the definition of those things, there will be consequences to be paid. This is part of the doom that's being talked about. And I know so often in, in church preachers, on media preachers and stuff like that, we're hearing all this about our nation and things that are going on and how rapidly all these things are happening. And that kind of doom and gloom kind of uh, picture. As we go on, Micah 2, 1 and 2, it said, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and they seize them and houses and take them. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his inheritance. And, you know, we're hearing uh, so much of this happening right now. Uh, I could go into great detail especially uh, as a landlord and some of the things that are happening state and national wise that they're you know, telling men like me that own private property what I can do and can't do with it anymore. Um, a lot of you are feeling that. How many are hearing about the inheritance tax and things of that nature that are coming down the pipe? You know, these are all things that we hear. And this is what he was saying. Woe to those who plan these kind of evil and this kind of stuff. Then it goes on to a national level in Micah chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Her leaders judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortune for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. All right, so Micah is specifically talking to the nation of Judah, talking about the city of Jerusalem, which was always the capital and the main city and the temple mound. Think about it. What's he say to them? These leaders of their people were taking bribes, doing all these things that were wrong in the sight of God. And what were the leaders saying? We're gods. We're blessed. All in the midst while they were doing these things. Sound familiar? What did it say? They were saying no disaster will come, none of these things will happen, and what happened? It describes it in the end of it. Jerusalem was taken. Uh, Judah was uh, destroyed. They were carried off into captivity by Babylon, and all these things came to, to pass. So as we go on here, Micah 7, 2 said that the godly have been swept from the land, not one upright man remains. All men lie and wait to shed blood every uh, each hunts his brother with a net. How bad does that situation sound? It's that everybody was doing this. Is this true now? Honestly, I don't think this is true now. But I think it's progressing that way. Um, we have literally seen over the last couple of weeks on media, national media, Sons and daughters versus moms and dads. Uh, people turning each other in for different things and whatnot. I'm just saying these are little peaks of those kind of things that are happening. And in the scriptures, there was a time in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, right before the ark was built by Noah. It says in the scriptures in verse 5, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. I know, looking out at you all, 
this isn't the case. I know that many of you in here have good, honest, integrable kind of thoughts and, and things that you believe. But things are progressing in a way that the remnant has got to remain strong. Last week we talked about regroup, teaching and telling truth and preaching that truth to our sons and our daughters that they're getting in and grasping it. We are living in a time, and you guys have all heard this, there is nothing new under the sun. There is no sin committed that hadn't already been thought of, uh, that all sin is common to man. We all know these things, but I'm here to tell you that the multitude or the, the uh, floodwaters of those kind of things to our children and to our grandkids, those younger, that they are coming so quick. And I think all of you in this room realize that. How do we keep from being this? To have an ever inclination of the thoughts of the hearts were on evil all the time. Um, and one of the thoughts of that is that they were on selfish thoughts, me first kind of thoughts. What does the Lord require? A lot of you guys, when you think about Micah, this is probably the scriptures that you think of. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require? Okay? So, if I said, for church today, there are some requirements. Uh, number one, you need to wear clothes. Okay? Anybody have a problem with that requirement? You know, we see that sometimes. You walk into a store. Uh, shoes and shirt required. Where in the world do you have to put a sign like that to, in order to have people obey? Well, probably Walmart. But how, however, however, you know, these things happen. Here, God is saying this is what was required. So what do you think when you read something like that in the scriptures? You better pay attention. You better listen to what's coming. This is what it says. To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This is what God requires. So think about it real quick. What is it to act justly? You guys in this room, you're acting justly right now. Even all of our young folk, we're acting justly. We're, we're treating each other with respect. Not everybody's talking at the same time. We're all listening. We're, we're doing right. We try to act right. We try to behave right. All of that sort of stuff, it goes into what is justice, that it is to be right or righteous. And Jesus Christ is that example of that. To love mercy. What's it mean to love mercy? You know, I got to thinking about this the other day. I, I was getting ready in the morning, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, what, what can I do or any of us do that affects God? He's sovereign. He's so much bigger than any of us. He spoke the world in creation. He spoke the entire universe in creation. How in the world can anything I do affect him one way or the other? And then this is what I started to think about. Whose image have you been created in? God's. And when it says that, does that mean your, your skin? What color you are? What height you are? What sex you are? Does it mean any of that? No, what's it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, look at the screen here. Yeah, love, justice, mercy, grace. God, he feels joy. God, he gets frustrated when people turn their backs on him. You know that he has these abilities to feel emotion. Now, Unlike us, he's not controlled by those things too often or ever. However, for us, you know, we're constantly swimming in those things. So when it says to love mercy, that's a depiction of who God is to us. The mercy he's shown us is the mercy that I'm to show another. When somebody wrongs me, you know, I may in my mind want to be like, oh, I want to just knock them out. But to show mercy is to Think about how would Jesus react? What would he have me do? And then the last one, to walk humbly with God. And this is the key to all three of these things up here is that last part, with God. How do we walk humbly with God? Well, first thing is, I know I'm not in control. 
And that's one of the, fir the first and hardest things of being a Christian. God is in control. And I need to release and give him that control. And I need to do it humbly. You know, when we speak in Psalms 139 of how God knows you so intimately that he knows every detail about you, the psalmist writes this beautiful depiction of how even in your mother's womb, God knew you. Does that mean anything to you all and what's going on in today's society? That even in the womb, God had created and knows us? But then it goes on to say, the psalmist writes at the very end of it, he writes, Search me, O oh God. See if there's any, you know, sin in me, anything that needs to be fixed or, or changed. Why would the psalmist write that if he says God already knows us? And he knows us better than we know ourselves. Because of control. I humbly submit myself to the control of God Almighty. That's a big, big thing. And as we go on here, one of the biggest parts of doing that is to stop justifying. All right, so how many of you said you ever got in trouble? I was the youngest child of three sons. I was ornery. I got in more trouble than my other two brothers put together. My parents said I got more spankings than all the others combined. Um, you know, that I was always trying to just cause mischief. It was always kind of fun, but I was the guy that was sticking the stick into my brother's bicycle wheels as they went by. You know, I was the one that would grab the back of the bike. Uh, I would do something like, here's one of my favorite all-time ones. Both of my brothers were perfectionist. And when they had toys, their toys were to be looked at but not played with. If they did play with them, they were very precise with it and very nice with them. And then they would put them back in their boxes and put them on their shelves in their closets or whatever. That wasn't me at all. And how many of you know Transformers? One of my brothers had one of the new Transformer toys. Well, he was gone. I decided I was going to play with that toy. And that toy deserved to be played with. And so I played with it, and I played with it pretty hard. And it went in half. What would you do if you was in my shoes? You put it back together. Back in the box, when they pull it out, somehow it just breaks apart. I don't know what happened. You know, we tend to be creatures that justify. And, and you know, it came to fruition in that whole story that my parents found out. What do you think my mom and dad accused for that? They, I was the first person they came to. Isn't that ridiculous? But, you know, my justification was that toy needed to be played with. Anyway. We got to stop justifying. Micah 6 1 says, Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up and plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. The whole idea of the description is when we talk about the mountains, we talk about God, the righteous, the mountains were considered kind of that illustration or picture. Who are we to plead our case before God? Which of you can stand here today or go home into your closet or wherever it is and, and plead before God? Hey, I haven't done a thing, God. What are you talking about? Oh, you know, oh, oh, you want to bring up that time I did, you know, I lied or whatever. Well, I have a good reason for that. Is there ever a good reason for sin? Can we justify before God right and wrong? Can we tell God you don't know what you're talking about? Any of you ever tried that with your mom or dad? Probably didn't end up, end up well. It goes on to say in Micah 6, 6, and 8, through eight, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before and the exalt and exalt God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So what is it talking about here? Any of you ever come into church, sermons being preached, you're going through church? And you're feeling guilty about something that's happened. Some sin that you've committed. Something you've gave into. Anyone ever been there? You know, probably all of us at some point. And you come into church and you're trying to figure out how to feel better. Or how to get over this. <coughs> How's that possible? Well, I can tell you, if you'll write out a check 
for something with at least three digits? No, I'm totally joking. All right? Please scratch that if you think that I was being serious. You can't put in a bigger offering. You can't <coughs> just be nicer to people. All these kind of things aren't going to pay the price. What pays the price? Jesus Christ, indeed. And so this morning, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my, he must know what I did this last week. He must have known what happened there last year or two years ago. He must know what's going on inside of me. Let me tell you, if you're feeling that way this morning, if you're watching and you're feeling that way, the only way to get right, the only hope that we have is to humbly walk with the Lord and submit ourselves here and now to God Almighty. He's the only one that can justify. So stop trying to justify things. Stop trying to pay for things and let Jesus Christ do what he does best. And that is restoration, redemption, and healing for us. Goes on. Psalm 51, 6 and 7. You'll remember this from a few weeks ago. But in the midst of David's confession of guilt and shame and all this, he talked about, and we talked about this in the sermon a few weeks ago, verse 6, Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. And then verse 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. This is what has to take the place of justification. If in any way or means this morning you're trying to justify the sin that you have committed, it's got to stop today. You have to surrender before the Lord God Almighty and allow Him to be Lord over it. Remember what David also said in that reflection? He said, I have sinned against who? God. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of other people that David was involved with that would have said, uh, you sinned against us. But David ultimately says, my sin, my sin, your sin is before God. Now, as we roll on here, uh, and this is the thing we, we often hear, and I've been there before. Uh, I've had the lectures from mom and dad and things of that nature, um, and I can remember feeling this way. I don't want to hear it. Any of you ever feel like that? How many of you like to be lectured? Arr. Ain't nobody likes that. Except for Ron. I'll lecture you later. All right. This idea of not wanting to hear it, the denial that most of us, uh, this is usually our human mechanism, our coping mechanism uh, when we're being confronted. But Micah 2, 6 and 7 said, Do not prophesy, the prophet says. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should it be said, O house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord angry? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to him whose ways are upright. And just a, a quick explanation to that. Uh, you can hear it. We hear it all the time. Um, we know wrongs are being committed. And I, I don't say a whole lot necessarily about the specifics in our nation, but when we are allowing full-term abortions to be legalized in our nation as practice, we will pay the price for that. I don't care what side of the fence you sit on that issue, there will be a price to be paid by the almighty sovereign God. The Lord tells us that the blood is sacred that is sacred in every human being, that it is sacred in animals, and that there will be an account for every blood spilt. When is a person human? Before conception. Do you hear what I'm saying? When is a person human? It starts before conception. See, I'm taking it a step further, right? Yes, at conception, when a husband and a wife, or when, a, when a, they come together and a, and a child is, is conceived, uh, yes, purely human. But when did God say he knew us? Before one day of our life ever came into creation or conception. Think about that. How powerful that God knows us that intimately. Incredible. 
He goes on to say at the end of this, you know, the first part of it is, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen. I'm going to just, you know, plug my ears and go, na na na, boo boo. I'm not going to listen. You know, how, how often do we see that attitude? We adults, we don't get over it. Here at the end it says, but what does this prophecy do? Well, for the upright, it's good. That's talking about you in this house. When we hear the words of truth, when we hear what God has to say, when we hear there's a consequence to be paid, we take action. The last Micah 2.11 said, If a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, he would be just the prophet for these people. Don't we got a lot of prophets like that today? Well, listen, if a liar and deceiver comes and says, For you we have plenty of wine and beer, he would be just a prophet for this people. Is that true? In the scriptures in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, does anybody else see a quick problem real quick there? That Timothy has a lowercase t. That just drives me crazy. Who, who made these things? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead? And in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. What does it say is going to happen in our time? That they'll gather teachers around them to say whatever their itching ears want to hear. Do you remember what the woe was earlier when he was talking about the leaders? Remember, they were accepting bribes. They were cheating the people. They were doing all these things and saying, we have God. We have a... Tommy, that's inappropriate. Please don't say that. But we have a nation right now that continues to spew out these sort of things. We have to stand for what's right and true no matter what. According to the scriptures... We are the one that are responsible for that truth in season and out of season. And what does it say for every one of us? We are to be prepared to give the truth. As we look at the last part here is hope. And I think it's so important for us to hear this because we get so frustrated. And I know it. We can hear it. We feel it. So frustrated with everything going on. But there's hope. And the Bible says this of you people in this room, all Christian men and women, that we are the remnant and that we hold that truth. That if we do that genuinely in kindness and love, we are that remnant of Jesus Christ. It goes on to say of the hope that we are called, any of you ever heard that word before? We're called watchmen. What is the definition of a watchman or a watchman? Or a woman, I guess I could say. What is it? That is a person that watches for what's happening, what's coming, what troubles lie ahead. That they're calling out to the people, there's trouble coming. I'll give you a quick illustration of this. And I don't want you to feel bad for me. But this last week, I got one of those little handy dandy blood tests. Any of you guys ever get those blood tests? And I got some of those numbers that came back, and some of them were like, Whoop, way up there. And I'm really uh, disappointed in myself, uh, disappointed in those results. But you know what? I don't care what those tests say. I'm going to do whatever I wish or want. I have that choice. I can keep doing exactly what got me to those numbers. And guess what's going to come? Yeah, the numbers get higher, my health will continue to deplete or whatever the case may be, and I'll find myself in a bad situation. The watchman, that blood test, showed me what was wrong. I can respond in one or two ways. I can listen to the watchman and respond appropriately, or I can say, forget you. This is what it said in the scripture, but as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. 
I wait for God, my Savior, my God will hear me. How are we responding in this house today? You and I. We pray. We get on our knees. We fast. We declare the truth. We uphold what's right. We stand for what's right. We put that out there for people to see. We encourage people. We do that in love and grace. We hear what the watchman says. We know what sin is being committed in our country. We know what is happening in bigger schemes and political schemes and things of that nature. But we proclaim truth. We are the remnant. The last of what it says here in Micah, uh, Micah chapter 5, he goes on to prophesy the birth of Jesus Christ. Cool thing, right? You notice on the screen, how many years previous to Jesus' birth did he tell these things? Good reading. 700 years. And guess what? Jesus did come. He was born. We physically know this. Factual proof. Uh, historical. Secular and Christian history tells of this. Uh, that Jesus Christ was a factual person that lived on this earth, that died for us, and that factually rose again. But what's it say here at the bottom? It says it in the scripture. What does it say of Jesus? He is coming again. Guess what? You think the first part was right? Yep. Guess what about the second part? It's right as well. And so the very last part of what Micah wrote in the end of his uh, letter here, he said, Who is a God like you? Who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. Amen. The truth of God's word tells us that God Almighty is the way, the truth, the light, Jesus Christ. The promise of what he said in these last words is that who is a God like him that forgives? Who is a God like him that restores? Who is a God that will continuously see these things but yet call out for us to repent? Our God. He's almighty. Last week, as I wrapped up, I said, we have to regroup. And I think it's important for all of us in this room to regroup. We are what, first and foremost? Children of the Most High God. We are Christians. We are Christ followers. So whatever descriptions we go by, you know, when most people ask, what do you do for a living? Or, 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 or who are you? You know, we start to say our jobs and all that kind of stuff. Bottom line is we're a Christian. And we can say what we do. Uh, you know, I'm a preacher. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. I'm a coach. I'm a whatever. And so we go through the description. But bottom line, we are Christians. And this is the thing I, I really feel like we've got to get across here as we regroup. We cannot be divided as Christian men and women. And this country we live in is strongly trying for, for us to do that. They want us to classify ourselves into political parties. They want us to classify ourselves into different groups. The thems and the us. Or you against me. We live in a world today that tells us that intolerance, it, it, the description or a description of tolerance is that if you do not take what I believe as the same level of what you believe, then you're not being tolerant. And you guys know my word for that. It's hogwash. God's word is eternal and true. And so I'll wrap up with this last statement here. When we live in such a time like these and you guys do because you're here you're these right now living in these times when we live in this kind of a time and it's confusing and all this stuff is happening and they want it to point fingers and all that kind of stuff we've got to hold on to what we know is absolutely true and that is the truth of god and jesus christ that is why i am so firm on telling you all you need to be in a daily reading plan a lot of you in this room have completed one month of bible daily reading Praise God. That's good. Keep it up. February 1st is just a couple of days away. Jump in February 1st and start in with a plan. Start reading along. 
get the word of God into you. The only way you will ever recognize counterfeits is if you know the truth. And we say that all the time in this house. So with that in mind, would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Father, we give you the praise, honor, glory, majesty, holiness. You are so worthy. Whatever we face, whatever we go through, whatever's happening, whatever comes, whatever circumstances arise in our lives, we will trust in you. There is no other. There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved except through you, Jesus Christ. And Lord, you have told us, the prophecies have stated it, the things that are happening. We know the sins that are around us, that if we participate, if we join in, that we are not glorifying you. So Lord, we call right now to be humbled in your presence, that we seek your forgiveness, that we seek your newness of life, that we live righteous and true by your definition, by what you determine. So Lord, with all those things in mind, we claim once again you, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. I pray over each man and woman in this place that they would know that truth, that they would confess that name, and that they would walk in your ways. Lord, we do want to continue to pray over our nation. We pray for healing. We pray for revival. We pray for that more specifically for your church, and for this community as a whole. It's in your almighty name, Jesus Christ, we ask and pray these things. Amen. Would you please stand as our praise team leads us?
We do have some quick announcements before leaving today and some prayer requests. Uh, I, I am going to pray over our offerings and things of that nature as well. Um, but as far as announcements, we have the con congregational, and I said it right, congregational meeting next week directly after church service. Probably be about five minutes. So make sure and stick around after church to uh, just approve and to look over the spending plan for this, this year. Uh, we also have the Super Bowl soup, as in food, bowl, uh, food drive this coming through this next Sunday for the soup kitchen. Bulletin has items that you can purchase and buy and place out on the table there. Um, you, probably most of you realize we do soup kitchen twice a month here. Uh, it's a great thing to do, and uh, we serve a large amount of people in that. If you have not signed up for giving statements, this is the last week to do that. It's out on the Welcome Center to sign if you want a giving statement for tax purposes. And we have Bible study at 930 uh, this coming Wednesday. On prayer requests in your bulletins, we do have a number of folks that we want to continue to keep in prayer on a daily basis. Jeff Reed made it successfully to Tanzania. Uh, didn't have to quarantine. He's getting to work. He's got one month over there to kind of regroup all of our pastors and churches and well projects and everything going on and meetings. So we want to pray for his safety and provisions there. And then we also sat down to continue to pray for Sarita and dealing with some of the family issues with her dad's passing. Uh, we did have mentioned that Ron uh, Daniels, our, our superintendent, regional superintendent or something like that, his wife passed away Friday kind of unexpectedly. So we want to pray for the Daniels family. Um, was there any other prayer requests, Adam? All right, so the uncle that we've been praying for with Adam. Any other? All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads and we will close in prayer here. Father, uh, we want to give you the praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for your patience and mercy. Uh, thank you for our church family here and the provisions that you have poured out on us. Uh, Lord, help us to be faithful with those and to use them however you see fit. Uh, Lord, we want to see miraculous things happening, and we are. Uh, we've seen that work done through uh, missions like Jeff and, and the work the church here has done and, and through that, uh, Lord, we just pray for your continued hand and blessing on that for provisions in that. Uh, Lord, I want to continue to uh, lift up to you, Jeff, and your safety on him as he's in Tanzania. I pray over Sarita and just the wisdom and guidance and peace as she's dealing with these family issues. Uh, for Ron Daniels, we just pray for him, his family, as they're going through such a uh, tragic loss. And I just pray your hand of peace and blessings upon them. I lift up to you Adam's family, for his grandma especially, and the rest of the family as his uncle's passed. I pray for your peace uh, in this situation, this time of saying goodbye uh, to his body. And Lord, I want to say a quick word of thanks for uh, just uh, Jeanette's sister Nancy, Nancy doing so well with her cataract surgery and uh, for the blessings you've uh, poured out in that. Lord, we continue to pray for safety over our schools. We pray for this community. We pray for our state and just uh, leaders, uh, schools and things of that nature. We pray for a revival. We pray for open eyes and hearts. Uh, we pray for an, uh, just a humble heart to, to repent and do the things that you've called it to at first. Uh, Lord, we pray for that for our nation. We pray that for our leadership. Uh, we just pray that you would bring revival. Uh, Lord, that we would be a part of that and that we would teach truth, stand right, and, and live for you the way that you call us to. Uh, again, Father, thank you for the time of uh, gathering here. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for our family. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
so much for worshiping with us this morning. I pray you all have a wonderful week. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>